we're going to have a good time around the word today, so I'm going to need your encouragement. So there, somebody say amen. amen. Somebody shout hallelujah. Okay, so that will be the last one for today. Because I have some pretty bitter medicine. But they tell me that a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. So if you'd stand on your feet with me, and I'm going to read our text. Read our text. And I'm going to be reading from Genesis chapter 16. And I'm going to begin at verse 1. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. And if you would follow along as I read, if you are there, please say amen. It says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. After Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Abram's wife Sarai took Hagar, the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to her husband Abram as his wife. He went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her sight. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be upon you. I gave my maid into your arms, but when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your maid is in your power. Do to her what is good in your sight. So Sarai treated her harshly, and she fled from her presence. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will become too many to count. And so I'm going to speak to you this morning from the subject, co-parenting with a difficult ex. Co-parenting with a difficult ex. Would you bow with me as we pray? Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy and your kindness toward us. We pray that you would superintend every word that we say, every step that we take, to the end that you will be glorified and that your people will be edified and encouraged. I pray that you would bless our time together around the word in Jesus' name we pray, amen, and thank God. You may take your seats, and I would like for us to just give God praise for the, for the fact that we had four candidates who arrived, uh, and the other two are here, and so we will baptize at the end of the service if you are unable to remain we understand. I do want to engage you today, and so I'm going to be very deliberate, and I'm going to stay as close to my prepared text as possible, because one of the most wonderful things about being a student of Scripture is that you never know when God is going to do something extraordinary in your life. I have studied Scripture. I have gone through um, a number of years of, semin of seminary to the point where I was able to earn a doctorate degree. 
And so I felt like I was pretty knowledgeable about Scripture, and this is a text that I have taught through um, any number of different times. And as I, t as I studied um, for this particular uh, message this morning, I, I found a spiritual blind spot in me. And that one of the things that I want to alert you to is that we have spiritual blind spots. And we need to be open to let God shed light on those spiritual blind spots. And so I want to begin by saying to you something that's obvious, and that is that life is a series of choices. That, that every day you are going to make choices, and some of them are going to be inconsequential, where you buy your groceries, whether you shop at Amazon or Walmart.com, really, in the end, won't matter very much. You might save a few pennies one way or the other. But there are other decisions, other choices that you make that will have far-reaching consequences, where you go to school. Uh, what you choose as your major and what job you're going to pursue or career, who you will marry. All of these are decisions that will have far-reaching consequences. Abram and Sarai made a decision that resulted in a blended family, and it had far-reaching consequences, not just for them, but for us as well. And when I talk about blended families, I'm talking about when a married couple comes together and they bring children that were born outside of that marriage for which they have physical, emotional, or financial responsibility for. So that's my definition of a blended family. And I know that there are blends of blended families. I know that sometimes people ain't married, um, sometimes that there are lots of extras that come in. But for the most part, that's the core. When I talk about blended families, I'm talking at the core a married couple with children that were not born in that marriage. And I'm going to suggest to you that that may be the most difficult decision that you've ever made to bring a blended family together. Now, there are principles that emerge from this text that I believe will help us in our decision-making. And then there are four lessons at the end that are built on these principles, and I'm hoping that I will have sufficient time to get through all of this material. Because at the end, I want to share with you my epiphany. And, and for me, it was a real blessing. Four important principles. Let's look at them. The first one is never underestimate God's power and ability to have an impact on your life. No matter what your situation, no matter what you are going through, don't make the mistake of underestimating what God can do in your situation. Let's begin with um, verse 1. It says, Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. Okay, if we were to drill down here, you would already know that this chapter, verse 16, is a parallel to chapter 12 where God promised Abram that if he would leave his country and go to a place where he told him, he would make him a great nation. But in Genesis chapter 11, verse 30, it says that his wife had had no children. So you can't very well form a nation if you can't make babies. That was kind of... Okay, yeah? Okay. So Sarah said to Abram, now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. This verse is pregnant. This verse says, says volumes about where Sarah was in her feelings and in her head. 
And then the second part says, please go into my maid. Perhaps I will obtain a child through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. That's kind of like, I don't even have to say kind of like, do I? That's like you inviting the cleaning lady to come over to your house, and because you haven't had any kids, you say to your husband, here is the cleaning lady. Go for what you know. Can I get a witness? If nothing else, that would be strange behavior today. So, so number one, y'all not going to relate to this. Because this was absolutely culturally acceptable, even desirable. God told Abram to leave his home and go to a strange place. And he said if he obeyed, God promised that a great nation would come through him. But they had been in the land for 10 years and Sarah was barren. She had no children. And so her anxiety was understandable, but not acceptable. It's okay for you to get anxious, but you cannot allow your anxiety to cause you to make decisions that you'll regret for the rest of your life. Scripture says, be anxious for what? Nothing, but in all things with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Make your requests known, and what? The peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ. In other words, get somewhere and sit down. (laughs) Why? Because God does not always move on a schedule that meets with our approval. Sometimes God is telling us to wait God tells singles to wait before you become sexually active. A couple of amens. (laughs) Because that is not God's divine design. And he knows that the more active you are, the greater the possibility If you sow enough oats, there's the great likelihood that you will have a crop. Can I get a witness? So God says, wait, but we have people who who just can't wait. I wish I had a praying church because because blended families would never happen if people could wait. I'm, I'm not through yet. God tells couples in difficult marriages to wait. Don't divorce just yet. I'm doing something. But the pain is too much. The indignity is too much. The sense of unfairness is too much. And so you have to go ahead and you have to pull the trigger. But God says, wait. You said, but pastor, you don't know my situation. You're absolutely right but I know your God. (laughs) And I know he's able. Somebody say he's able. (laughs) See, but see, but you don't believe. When you're hurting bad enough, it's hard to see that God is able. But he's saying, wait. God is saying that if you're contemplating marriage and you have not yet achieved spiritual maturity, you need to wait. Marriage is for grown folks. I'm not talking about you have reached the age of of 18 or not. I'm talking about you need to have some miles on you. 
You need to have been mistreated and bounced back so that you know that being mistreated is not the end. Everybody thinks that marriage is glorious. It is for one night. <laughs> Woohoo! Woohoo! Down, down, do you dance? Down, down, do you dance? Everybody's happy for one night. Sarah could not wait. Sarah, I could not wait. God's delay in her mind was an indication that he was either unable or unwilling to give her a child. When we judge God by our circumstances, and that leads us to take matters into our own hands, we are cruising for a bruising. Don't help God. God has been working on this before you were even thought of. God can handle your situation. He can handle your husband. He can handle your wife. But you just, you need to turn them over. Not cuss them out. Oh, they deserve it? I mean, I often think if I could just give them a good cussing, everything would be fine. <laughs> but 1 Peter 3 says you win them without a word, with your chaste behavior. <sighs> Consequences. So, you need to not underestimate what God can do. Second principle, trust God's timing. He has a purpose for every delay. Trust God's timing. He's doing something in the silence. But we can't stand silence. We can't study without white noise. We can't ride in our cars without something on. Try driving your car down the road with nothing on. Genesis 16, 2a says, So Sarai said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I will obtain a child through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. After Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Abram's wife Sarah took Hagar the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to her husband Abram as his wife. God may be getting ready to do something incredible in your life. Don't give in to your feelings. Hold on to your faith. God's timing is perfect. Don't allow your pain or your impatience to cause you to make a decision that you will regret. God does not waste opportunities and he does not waste silence. When God is silent, it is not time to panic. I think that sometimes we don't know what the plan is, but we are control freaks. All control people, raise your hand. You, you, got, you just got to run it. <laughs> Turn it over to Jesus. Turn it over to Jesus. But you can't. Oh, because he doesn't know exactly how I want it done. The third principle is likened to the first two. Consider carefully the consequences of your choices. If you don't get anything else, think about this. 
All you single people, raise your hand. There are consequences for indiscretion. But I, I don't understand it. I mean, this is 2018, right? How long have we had, I mean, forget the fact that you're going you're gonna to thumb your nose in God's face and have sex outside of marriage. But, but they've been making stuff for a long time. Am I missing this? Okay, may, maybe I, I, I'm old. I'm 70, about to be 71, and maybe I, maybe I just missed it. You don't have any business doing it in the first place, but don't be, don't be sinful and stupid. Can I get a witness? Is anybody in here tracking with me? I mean, just, it's a no-brainer. Excuse me. Okay, track this. 16.4, he went into Hagar and she conceived. That would be expected. And when she saw that... Why, why y'all laugh? I didn't write this. <laughs> I'm trying to help y'all make better decisions by, by looking at the decisions someone else made. What in the world was in Hagar's mind? She is my husband. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her sight. Boy, Ooh, that's, that's a chick thing. <laughs> I don't mean to be, be but, but what? So, so she, gets, she gets her husband. She gets pregnant. Then she walking around like that, you know. Sarah said to Abram, may the wrong done me be on you. Now she's thinking. <laughs> Duh! <laughs> Wake up. I gave my maid into your arms, but when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. Okay, she, he said, you are in this. And Abram is... All he said is, I said, okay. <laughs> don't, don't put people in an untenable situation. I mean, what was Abram going to say? Nah, nah. But Abram said to Sarah, Behold, your maid is in your power. Do to her what is good in your sight. So Sarah treated her harshly, and she fled from her presence. What, is, what does Abram do? Not my problem. She's your maid. So let's, let's dig into this. Sarah suggested, and Abram agreed, that Hagar should become a sister wife. So they're complicit. She never considered how she would feel watching her husband loving on another woman. They're in the same house together. I'm pretty sure that Abram doesn't just walk around, you know, and hang around outside. There's something. Don't you think she should have considered this? Okay, so why didn't some of you consider this? It's so obvious, isn't it? 
when you are looking at it in your rear view mirror. I should have made a different decision. But it's amazing. It does little good to close the barn door after the horses are out. Don't y'all go quiet on me now. I said, wait. Amen. Give me an amen. Give me an amen. all over the house. Amen. Amen. All right. Okay. I feel better. When you choose to bring a blended family together, you will have to make some difficult decisions which could be made more difficult by a difficult ex. Okay. So, we're going to drill down here. So, y'all track with me. A married couple in a blended family must choose to make that new marriage relationship the priority relationship. Kids second. If you're going to marry, if you a woman are going to marry a man, don't marry a man you won't trust with your children. Don't marry a man that you can give your, can't give your submission to in deference to your children. Okay, now I know this is tough. I, I know that some of you are already saying, okay, this, it's fight time now. My kids come first. That's all right. Just don't get married. <laughs> Just let it be you and your kids. You can't have both. You can have a real marriage and be wedded to your kids. Because you're going to have a partner that you're going to get to know who may not agree with everything that you do. And sometimes there are going to be conflicts over how you parent. And if you're always deferring to the kids, just leave the door open because somebody's leaving. I'm not saying don't love your kids. I'm saying that the whole concept of marriage involves a reprioritization of relationships. A man leaves his father and mother, which means that there is an emotional reprioritization, and he cleaves to his wife. This is tough. So don't make the blended family more difficult by not being able to make this choice. If you're unable to make the choice, that's okay. But what you have to realize is you may not be ready for marriage. That's okay. Nobody's telling you not to love your kids. We're telling you you're going to make a blended family nearly impossible if you're not able to do this. Second, parents in a blended family must accept that there are no step parents and no step children. There are just parents and children. Okay, okay, wait. Wait before you clap because this is a loaded, loaded deal here, boy. Okay, what you are saying is that if you are a woman, marrying, then the father of your children and his unstable girlfriend <laughs> are going to parent your children. Now, you, you need to check all that out before you sign up. You need to check Check the papers of all the people who are going to be involved. Because you don't know where you're going to find the craziness. <laughs> okay, now don't laugh. I am serious as Noah was when he built the ark. This is why blended families fail. Because up pump pops somebody that you didn't know and that you don't want your kids over at their house because, you know, 
Naomi is there. <laughs> Find out about Naomi up front. And, and one of the things that we try to do in premarriage counseling is that when we have this situation, we bring all the people, all the stakeholders together, including the kids. And we sit down and say, now this is what y'all are about to do. Now, understanding this, do you still want to sign? And I recommend that if you're going to do it, that you do that. If you've already done it, you need a checkup. You need to go in. If you're having problems in this arena, because I will tell you, it's a difficult area. The other thing that I want you to see is that blended families must avoid certain personal interactions between exes. Keep it professional. You don't go pick up Henry without fully communicating, I'm going to pick up Henry and you can go with me. You have to understand that, that you don't go to lunch, you don't go to dinner unaccompanied. You take your wife or your husband with you whenever you are going to interact. You don't just drive over. Don't, don't let no emergency come up. <laughs> I'm sorry that I have to say this to you. Okay. Okay, and... Adults in a blended family should avoid making deals with an ex that are not fully communicated and agreed to by all concerned. Don't make any deals. You know, can you come pick up Henry? You know, this is not our regular day, you know, and I'll meet you at the... You tell everybody about that before you go. Don't call back and say, I'm over at the Walmart and, you know, I'm, I'm with Naomi and... I'm picking up Henry. Okay. I'm going to move on because y'all are not tracking with me. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say there are rules of the road. Make them ahead of time and adhere to them. Amen. Okay, so now look, I'm, I'm out of time, but let me talk to you about my epiphany. Principle number four says, remember that God gives comfort for every wounded heart. And the text is verses 7 through 10. Um, Let's see, okay. Then the angel of the Lord, let me me go back here. Let me see if I've got this because that's not in the, okay. Looks like I, let me get, I want to read this for you in its entirety, so let's. Take a little time out and because I promised I wouldn't rush. And so verses 7 through 10 says, Now the angel of the Lord found her by the spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will, too, they will be too many to count. You know, I've done this so many times. And we always talk about the difficult ex, but we never talk about why the ex is difficult. We, we assume that maybe the ex is just a disagreeable person. And they want to be disagreeable for spite. But the fact is, in many instances, that's not true at all. So, so Hagar had Abram's baby. And she got rolled under the bus. I suspect that there are times when based on a belief that they were the one, that some young woman had a baby with somebody that they loved, expecting that they would be the ones at the altar, only to find out 
that somebody else got the ring. No. Just between you and me, that would tick me off too. I, I, I might become a difficult preacher. <laughs> but I don't know why I never thought of this. I, I'm so busy trying to help couples navigate a difficult situation with no empathy for this person who may be embittered simply because they've been mistreated. And there's no place in the scenario for them. They're going to go to the wedding and the party and the other people stay home. And it broke my heart. Hagar did not ask to be brought to Canaan. And sleeping with Abram was not her idea. So in many ways, she was the victim. Now, I know that some are disagreeable for the sake of being disagreeable. But maybe, maybe there are others who are lamenting that they should have been the one. Maybe they were promised that they would be the one. Maybe they were deluded. Maybe they just wanted to be the one. And so my word to you is God always has comfort for the wounded heart. God never forgets the wounded heart. He sent an angel to Hagar. He says, Hagar, I've not forgotten you. He says, I know the plans that I have for you. The son that you bore to Abraham is legitimately his son. And so I will make him a nation. Now there are several important lessons that I'd like to leave with you. Because you know, as I contemplate this, this is a very, very difficult subject, and so we can't stand off a distance and pontificate. If you are living it, then, then I'm going to suggest that you are in the battle of your life and that what you're looking for is someone to care about your particular situation. God cares. And so, four lessons. Lesson one, God's delay does not always mean denial, and it never means disability. God can do anything, and if you will let him, he can impact your life. Second lesson, God's timing, God's timing is perfect, and he always keeps his promises. So, Learn how to wait. Learn how to trust God enough. And let me tell you this. It does not matter what mistakes, what bad decisions you have already made. God's grace is sufficient. You are not an outcast. You, 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 you may have to come up the rough side of the mountain, but you will not come up that mountain by yourself. God said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And so you may be in a difficult, challenging situation. Trust him. He's working on your behalf. Then lesson three, God allows you to make choices, but he expects you to accept the consequences. It may be that because of an indiscretion, you get a limp. And so you may have to spend the rest of your life with a limp. But that limp will always remind you, not of the mistake you made, but of the grace of God. Because God is a God of second chances. God is a God of second chances. See, this is not, this is not, this is not some trivial thing for me. I didn't even know that my mother was pregnant with my sister 
until I was going with her to the hospital. And she didn't have a husband. And I just pointed the finger at one of my friends to say, how bad must it feel? Because your mother had a baby and she wasn't married. And God says, I'll show you how that feels. So, so, so this is not, this is not some lecture. God is able. God can do more than you think that he can do if you will allow him. But wait on the Lord and be of good courage. He will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And then finally, God does not shield us from every hurt, but he comforts every wounded heart. God, God does his best work in brokenness. God does his best work when your life has been so ripped up that there is no obvious way for you to get home. And he will come in and he will be to you just what you let him be. He will fill your life to overflowing with his presence and he will allow you to minister to others out of overflow. God allowed me to develop an empathy that I never would have developed because of what I've been through. So, don't let anybody point a finger at you because if they're pointing a finger at you they're pointing one at themselves we are all guilty we are all culpable but I thank God that that he sent Jesus <laughs> let, me t let me tell you about this Jesus thing I don't have to worry about history history is just a story I tell but I have another story just like I have another home over in glory, and it's mine, mine, mine. Can't take the pain away. But I can tell you that there's someone who will make the pain bearable. And, and he doesn't give drugs. Rest in him. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, if you have not been delivered, if you have not personally experienced what it means to be able to say to your past, get thee behind me. Paul said that, 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 that I'm not there yet, but forgetting that which was behind I am looking for that which is before. I'm going to press toward the mark for the, call, for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I am not what I ought to be. <laughs> Ooh, but thank you, Jesus. I am not what I used to be. And he is still working on me. If you are here, if you are here and you need a change in your life, Jesus Christ is the only change. Everything else is temporary. Jesus Christ died for your sins. He was buried and God raised him from the dead. If you're here and you want to put your trust in Christ today, let me, let me invite you to come. But don't look around for somebody else. This is you personally. This is saying, I have been shackled by my past. I have been shackled by heavy burdens. I've been shackled by guilt. I, I'll tell you. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. If you want the cleansing of the blood of Jesus, I'm going to pray and then I'm going to ask you to get up and come and stand with me. Father, thank you so much for the goodness and kindness that you've shown toward us. Thank you for the truth of the gospel. Father, I pray you're pressing on someone right now that they will decide to trust Christ today. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.